Hi, my name's Andy, and this is the last video uh, on Scheme, the seventh video. Uh, if you've enjoyed these videos, please do drop me an email or do some kind of social thingamabob. Uh, let me know. Uh, let's get on with it. So, uh, the, today's video is about macros. Um, you may have heard of macros in other languages. They're quite different in Scheme, but the same fundamental idea is going on. I'm going to look at macros by basically following through one example of something we might want to do uh, that we can't do um, using the other parts of Scheme. And macros give us the kind of final uh, alternative uh, that basically lets us do anything whatsoever. Um, we're going to deviate a little bit into some philosophy about hiding complexity as well. And we're going to finish off by looking at how we might do something similar in other languages, what the kind of idiomatic way to do it in other languages might be. Okay, so here's our problem. Imagine we have a number, yeah, it's called num, and in lots of places in our code we want to do something uh, different depending on whether that number is zero or positive or negative. Or we might write code like you've got here at the bottom, this cond expression, which says if it's zero then uh, do one thing, if it's positive do another, if it's negative do another. And the things we're doing here is printing out z, p or n, but it could be anything we're doing. In different places in our program we do different things, but it's always based on these three conditions. Okay, so um, a common uh, maxim at the moment is dry, D-R-Y, don't repeat yourself. Um, and the reason you don't want to repeat yourself is because you want to be able to express a concept once um, and then not repeat it again because uh, you want to be able to use it as a higher level com uh, 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 concept. And uh, what that's doing really is hiding complexity. What you're um, achieving when you uh, give a concept a name and don't have to re-express it is you're hiding complexity. Uh, another way of putting that is that you're speaking at a higher level. You're, um, you code your concept once in this lower level and later on you just refer to it. Uh, you're speaking at a higher level. So what we would like to do uh, is avoid repeating this cond expression with the zero and positive and else parts um, every time we want to do something uh, involving zero, positive or negative. Instead we just want to be able to say, give this concept a name and use it without re-expressing it every time. The reason for that um, is that we don't want to have to think about it. We're thinking about um, a higher level problem and the implementation of zero, positive or negative is really not of interest to us. We should be able to say, do it once and leave it at that. Okay, so um, in programming languages, there are several ways of hiding complexity. This is what we do all the time. What we do is we express a concept um, and then use it. And the ways we do that is we write functions, which have names, and we, we write classes, which have names. Um, and the question is, are, there, are these always enough? Um, most languages we use have functions. Um, some of the languages we use have classes. Do we ever find ourselves needing more than that? Well, sometimes I find myself writing Java uh, and then writing some XML, which is exactly the same as it. Um, sometimes I, I even find myself writing the same code in two different languages. Um, sometimes I find myself writing loads and loads of classes, uh, which all really have have a, uh, the very, a very similar structure, but not in a way that you can express using inheritance and things like that. So the, um, I argue there are times where we need more than that. Um, and the people who wrote Scheme agree with me. Um, so the way that we can do more than that, what is more than that? Well, one way, and the most important way that, that I know of, the one that I think um, uh, is the most useful, uh, because it kind of encapsulates all the others, is extending the language. So um, there are two main ways you can extend a language. So um, uh, the one way is to generate code, which then gets passed on to that language compiler. And another way is to use um, some kind of in within the language mechanism to extend the language itself. And you could argue that uh, actually functions are kind of um, an in-language way of extending a language, but I'm talking about something that's um, uh, more radical than that, that gives you new new structures, um, new control structures, um, and hopefully the example that we're using will uh, make that a bit clearer. So some examples of code generation uh, 
that we see around us. Well, the the Qt or Qt library um, extends C++ a tiny bit. As part of their compiler setup, uh, they take in uh, code in a in a slightly higher level language to do with events, and they generate C++ underneath. You may or may not uh, know that when you're using uh, Qt because it, uh, it's hidden in the compiler setup, but that's what's really going on. Um, uh, another example of code generation, I believe some of the aspect-oriented Java um, uh, 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 libraries use code generation to produce, to, to drop your aspect code into each class. Uh, where do we see macros? Well, uh, anyone who's worked with a reasonable sized C library will almost certainly have used macros to um, wrap up some policy or uh, do some repetitive tasks. So we have seen macros um, if we've used C. Um, not not available in other languages. Um, another thing which is kind of a bit like this is templates and um, you could argue that templates in C++ are kind of a kind of a macro language, kind of a way of extending a language. Um, yeah. Okay, so here's our first attempt at encapsulating the concept of this three state thing uh, positive, zero or negative. So here's our three state function so we're defining a function, we're calling it three state. It takes in four arguments. The first argument is the value that we want to ask about. And the next three are the things you do depending on whether it's positive, negative, positive zero or negative. And here's the implementation. It's this cond expression that we've seen. Um, if it's zero, then the, the answer is zero body. If it's positive, the answer is positive body. Otherwise, it's negative body. OK, so does this work? Well, let's call this function. move myself out of the way. Let's call this function with uh, an argument of 100 and then three more arguments um, which are the um, the things we want to do depending on whether the, the first argument is positive, zero or negative. So when we run this what do you think is going to happen? What we want to happen is that it will print out P because 100 is positive. What actually happens is that it prints out PZN. The reason for that is that it actually runs those three commands before it even calls the three state function. It evaluates all the arguments to that function. Uh, all three of those arguments evaluate what, during their evaluation, they print out something and then they return uh, a null return value or a, a sort of void return value, I'm not sure. Um, and then it's that return value that gets passed in as arguments to the function. So that is, is what's get, the function is useless here. The, actually, what's happening is those three um, uh, displays are happening before we even get there. So uh, hopefully that helps you understand why we need this whole conversation. We can't just write a function. So here is the solution. Let me just slightly move myself back. Um, here's a solution. This is the way you define a macro in Scheme. So what you do is you do a defined syntax, uh, and what that uh, and that takes in uh, two arguments. One argument is the name of this bit of syntax that you're defining. So this is how Scheme knows uh, to start looking um, for a macro. Uh, and then the next part, the syntax rules part, which is the second argument to define syntax, is the um, the matching that you should do and the template that you should um, expand or substitute into to produce code. So what a macro does is it uh, it takes in it matches against a template and then it substitutes in sorry it matches against some kind of search pattern and it substitutes in um, in place of that so uh, some code. So syntax rules here um, you can you can provide a list of symbols which you want to use in your pattern matching. Um, um, but here we put bracket bracket uh, after the syntax rules. Uh, we don't have any keywords here that we um, we want to use in the pattern matching. Instead, the pattern that we want to match against is the next bit, which is just three state followed by four things: value, positive body, zero body, and negative body. So when you find in in the code something which says three state and then four arguments, we know to use this macro and substitute in the following piece of code. So the following piece of code is the cond expression which we're now familiar with. So what we're doing is rather than rather than running this code, we're substituting in this code. The key thing there is that um, the substitute in code, uh, which contains the zero body, positive body, and negative body, is not going to execute those unless you hit the right bit of the cond expression. So let's try it out. So this time, 
um, instead of uh, the function three state we have the macro three state so this thing that we typed here um, is going to match the, the pattern for that macro and when we run it it does indeed print out p because what's happening underneath is that that cond expression is being substituted in and then, and then run and the cond expression we already know does what we want it to do let's try it with zero we print out z and let's try it with minus 100 we print out n so it does work okay so that's it really for macros um, they're as simple as that. The syntax is a little bit awkward, um, but other than that, there's really no problem. So let's talk about how we would do this in other languages, and, and in particular, why Scheme is so special and exciting. So um, here is an example of a macro. Uh, these are this is C. Um, there's a macro here called three state, all in caps, which takes in four arguments: value, p body, z body, and n body. Um, and the way we define a macro in C is with that hash define. And uh, hash define has to be all one line, so we use these backslashes to, um, to continue the line onto other lines. So what we do is, whenever we find the word three state in our code, um, followed by some arguments, we substitute in the code at the top. So this is exactly analogous to what we're doing in the scheme macro, except in scheme there is um, you stay within the syntax of the language, whereas in macros, this all this stuff all gets substituted um, uh, as a kind of literal expression. So there's no checking on it. Um, it it's quite hard to debug, even compile errors, and, and particularly um, debug runtime errors in this kind of code is particularly difficult. Um, but yeah, this does work. Um, if you if you write this code, this three state code, you can reuse this concept of a three state in lots of places in your code. And it does indeed only execute the part um, th uh, that's relevant to that number. So it works. Um, yeah. So let's look at another thing we could do. So something that you have in Scheme and you also have in some other languages is quoting. Um, and the language that we talked about before, which has quoting, is JavaScript. So let's do a bit of JavaScript. So here we have a function called three state. It takes in four arguments, a value and the three bodies. But the three bodies that it accepts are strings. And what it does is, depending on the value of value, it evals one of those strings. So this is um, analogous to the quoting we've looked at in Scheme before. Um, the difference being, again, in Scheme, you're working within the language. You have um, lexing and uh, parsing going on. Uh, so you know that your code is reasonably um, well formed. In JavaScript, you're passing in a string, and that string could contain any, anything, absolute gobbledygook, and you won't find out about it um, until you actually execute that the right part of the three-state function. Then suddenly you'll find there was a syntax error, or you misspelled print, or something like that. But other than that, yeah, you can pass in strings to say what to do, depending on whether three is um, positive, negative, or zero. So this works too. Okay, so another way we could do this, um, and this is maybe a bit um, a bit idiomatic for Python, a bit Pythonic. Um, so I wrote the code in Python. So um, this way we uh, is using function pointers. So what we do is, um, if you look at the very bottom, we we can call the three state function. We pass in a value um, to check, and we pass in three things. And what those things are are function pointers. Uh, and th they're function pointers that are created by the PR function above. So all the PR function does is makes a function which prints out the argument you pass into it and returns it. Um, this may not look particularly familiar uh, in Python. It, it looks it looks quite a lot like scheme code, and it uses a closure in the same way um, that you have in scheme functions. You do have those in Python, uh, which is kind of interesting and fun. Um, Anyway, if you look at the main body of three state, all it does is, depending on uh, whether value is negative, positive, or zero, it calls one of those function pointers. And again, this works. So, uh, and again, Scheme has this concept. So, are you noticing that uh, you have a lot of options in Scheme for achieving this? Okay. So, now the last example, which I'm, I'm sorry to say, and I, I hope I'm not being biased. Um, I hope I did do this um, properly. The last example is a Java example. And I really did my best to make what I felt was an idiomatic way of doing this in Java. 
uh, and it's the only example that goes onto two pages. So you can draw your own conclusions from that. Perhaps I didn't do it the idiomatic way in Java, but if I did, uh, well, you can draw conclusions. Okay, so how would you do it in Java? Well, what I would, I think, would be the normal way to do this in Java is you would have an interface called I three state bodies, which has three methods defined on it: positive body, zero body, and negative body. And then your three state function is what you can see below. Uh, takes in a value and then takes in one of these I three state bodies, and then depending on the value, it calls uh, the the right function uh, based on whether it's positive, negative, or zero. Okay, so so far. Seems reasonable, maybe. Um, move myself out of the way again. Let's go over here now, shall we? Okay, so uh, the definition of it looks reasonable, but the, the key thing when you're abstracting a concept is that uh, the code that uses this code needs to be straightforward and simple. It needs to uh, uh, just easily take uh, let you say, this is what I'm saying, um, I've abstracted a concept. If the way of calling the abstracted concept is more complicated than just re-expressing the concept every time, you're not going to bother. You're going to re-express that, um, that cond expression or those uh, if-else if expression every time because it's just easier. Okay, so and I'm afraid, in my opinion, the Java example completely fails. So this is the way you would express, um, this, this is the way you would use the three state function um, that I provided on the previous slide. Uh, you pass in three and then you pass in um, an anonymous class uh, uh, which implements the i3 state bodies interface that was defined above, and you provide uh, the three bodies um, for the function based on positive, zero, or negative. Okay, so this does work, and it kind of does express the concept, but my goodness, look at it. And uh, yeah, this isn't supposed to be a rant against Java, but even the print function is about three times as long as in the other examples. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, the uh, scheme provides you all these different ways of abstracting from what you're doing, providing um, high-level concepts. Um, you've got macros, you've got quoting, um, and, uh, and you've got functions, you've got uh, closures which can give you things a bit like classes. Um, scheme is the most amazing language for just uh, uh, taking you away from um, the details uh, of the implementation and allowing you to talk in a higher language and almost every good scheme program apparently um, is actually at least one language and then the real program is written in the language that you've written um, macros are the kind of final last resort if you can't write your language as, as functions or functions which deal with functions you might have to do macros um, and actually expressing them is a bit awkward and I think a lot of people have written uh, their own macro functions which they feel are easier to use than the built-in scheme macros but the, the real the power is already there in the built-in scheme macros so uh, to conclude the series as a whole um, scheme it, it, it is just beautiful and simple and unbelievably powerful and what I would like to see coming out of me learning about Scheme and other people learning about Scheme is some of this power that we have which in principle could easily be available to me in my day job uh, when I'm not using Scheme I'd like to see that included in languages and we see some of that coming along we see Lambda functions um, appearing in both Java and C++ um, we see new languages coming along with all kinds of um, exciting features uh, but to me they sometimes deviate from basic comprehensibility um, we see Python which has a lot of these features already available to it um, perhaps perhaps some more can be added on perhaps you, if you had macros Python would be enough um, anyway uh, you might have your own opinions please do contact me um, let me know what you thought of the talks and how we, I can improve them and thanks a lot for listening <laughs>